kind of that's kind of like a cherry pick. Like it, it would be too easy. Just too, too easy. easy. Whether it be Egyptian and Sumerian, Egyptian and Marauder, Egyptian and Bantu, Egyptian and Chiluba, Egyptian and and the Basque languages, Egyptian and whatever. Like if you look at just monosyllabic roots, you are going to find a connection. And the point of doing this comparative work is to eliminate any universal features of all languages. Right. So right here, you see all of this. Um, these are, I think the majority of him just comparing just one, <clears throat> one phoneme between the languages and some of that's cut off. But you can see right here, um, now, now the, the, the crazy part about this, now you see right here where he says that the real matches are those um, where we will begin first with the monosyllable roots and it's, they, they're more important. And right here, he actually agree, like he agrees with what Lyle Campbell says, like which is just contradictory. It's like I just don't understand it. Um, he, he, what he says about the Proto-Bantu and Efik languages of Nigeria, he says, since the sighted matches are regular and often focus on two consonants, it could be, it could validly assume that it is a, the legacy of words of a common ancestor. So, uh, and Boley agrees with the, the methodology on the bottom. And he agrees with Lyle Campbell methodology, well, my, Lyle Campbell's um, uh, words referring to the the monosyllabic comparisons, how it's not reliable, but that's <laughs> that's one of the basis of his whole entire work. Doesn't make any sense. Monosyllabic works. First thing we're going to do, and then he comes over here and agrees with what Lyle Campbell is saying about monosyllabic rules. It just doesn't make any sense. At all. So on one hand, monosyllabic is not enough just to have one sound, and and he's agreeing with that. But then he's going and committing that same crime. Is that it, bro? Is that, <laughs> uh, almost in the same bro. Almost in the same sentence. Like that's how crazy it is. Like this is he's, weird. He's, this is for me. Like as a layman coming in. Like for all the people that's listening, that's a layman like me on this. I'm not a linguist. But common sense would, would tell you that you can't just use one sound because then that means that psychologically you're thinking that every single human on the earth means the same thing when they right. use the same sound. Correct. 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 My man. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Miss Valley Tree is right there, y'all. Valley Tree is right there. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy, bro. I'm not hey. even a linguist. I'm not even a linguist, but it's like, how 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 do you operate with that as um, your premise that every single language, every single person, when somebody does the, or when somebody does the, that they mean the same exact thing? How how come they can't mean something different depending on where you're from? Man, uh, look look. All right. We're not gonna jump ahead of ourselves, but you are a hundred percent on point. <laughs> when we cross that bridge, I'm going to refer back to Valley Trees. Yep, <laughs> I got you, bro. But you are hundred percent correct. All right, so um, hold on. All right, moving on. So okay, so the grammar and morphological comparison. Um, now this is like chapter six and. Seven. Uh -huh. He says with the establishment, what he calls the establishment of, oh, excuse me, um, establishment of phonetic correspondence in twenty six languages. Um, he wants to demonstrate the grammar and the and the, and the morphology between the six languages. I mean, as we've seen before, we touched on lightly thus far that these languages have a different um, history and ancestry than what he's postulating right here. But again, Mayor, if you want to touch on anything before I move on, but we'll see later on that, that his 
assumption regarding the grammar and morphology is just just in in, in error. Yeah, I mean, he's he's still sticking on the fact that he's proved uh, with the examples you know that we showed you. He's still showing that he's proved kinship. He's he's shown the connection uh, with the mother tongue and those other six languages. And just by looking at the, the past three, we know that they come from another another connection. So there's no way possible that they came from Negro Egyptian. There's no way that Negro Egyptian is the mother tongue of those three languages when you can even see the evolution of some of them. So I, I just think that it, it's almost like uh, he's just either being ignorant or he's going to continue to, to cherry pick on what works for him. Um, but yeah, you, you'll see it's a little bit more coming up. Now, the, the, would you call that circular reasoning? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, moving right along. Pull, yeah, okay, we're gonna move right along. Right. All right, so we got Egyptian and Zande. Cause I, I'm not, I'm not focused on saying go like it's clearly like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick them, turn into a Creole. You got it, Egyptian and Zande demonstratives like this, that, there, the. You know what I'm saying? Like you, if you compare it side by side, that's clearly not the same. Now, in in this in this uh, chapter of morphological correspondences, of course, he tries to make a connection between the Egyptian demonstratives, where you can see right here, the audience can see they they just don't look the same at all. Uh, but what he what he did was what what we'll see later on. He violated one of his premises or his. Uh, his principles of the comparative method. He says that you do not compare a proto language or proto reconstruction with a proto reconstruction. And he mm -hmm. does that, which he makes these demonstratives and other parts of or aspects of the, these languages appear to be cognate when they're really not. Because I can take any word, any phoneme, between any language and come up with a proto, uh, a proto phoneme, a proto sound, a proto language. I can do that. Anybody can do that. All you gotta do is put a little asterisk besides your reconstruction, and boom, you have a proto reconstruction. But that proto reconstruction doesn't mean it actually existed. You have to test that against the the languages that you use to determine whether or not your hypothesis is valid or not. And you got right here, uh, we got the pronouns. You got uh, first person singular, me, my. Uh, you got second person singular, you, your, um, so forth and so forth. If you just look at, you look at uh, Egyptian and Zombie side by side, and they, they appear to be, oh, you know what? The last three, the last three I didn't change. That's from something else, but we, we can change that. Oh yeah, the plural, uh, yeah, we can change that. Yeah, we, we change that because that, that's that's not that's not what I meant to put right up. Okay. But yeah, yeah, we can change that. All right, so you got a uh, you got the, the plurals, the plurals between Egyptian and uh, Zande. Zande used to just a uh, regular old uh, ah sound. And it's when plurals is just not the same. You got interrogatives, who, what, when, where, how, which, why, et cetera, et cetera, is, is not the same, not even similar. And for, for the general audience uh, looking on, I, I didn't put the examples in here because it was just way too confusing. All you seen was an asterisk and asterisk and linguistics showing is basically showing that uh this is his reconstruction. Mm -hmm. so really no, of, really no evidence. Of, Go ahead. No, just make sure you let them know when you put the asterisk, he's also saying that he's reconstructing a proto language, not necessarily just an active language. Exactly. And he did that all throughout chapter six and seven and eight. Um even the numbers, 
according to him, the numbers are cotton it, but I mean, you look at first, second, third, or one, two, three, four in both languages, like they just don't, they don't even look the same. And, and I challenge anybody to look up Zonde numbers and tr try to count and order the numbers in Zonde. Count to 50. Try it. And, 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 I could. And, and, Go ahead, bro. And I say, I'm going to say, this, this Geechee, I'm going to say, we'll, we'll make it even worse. The, the Zonde, the Zonde people is not even a, a ancient people. They they formulated in the eight, in the in the nineteenth uh, century. They the, yeah. the the Bandia and the and the Bangora people. Uh huh. It, 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 but 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 if you ignore a, a people's prior history, I mean that's not a problem. You but you, you but you're right though, brother Gucci. But yeah. a, a crucial but, thing we were always coming up across when it came to doing this is timing as far as like the time differences between these two languages uh, that was always something we came across but apparently he's always ignored it regardless um, and that that's fine if you're going to ignore it but show the evolution of it you know yep. Sh show how it became what changed into you know which are currently trying to connect it with not just say, hey, here's the connection. All right. Man, man, I mean, that that's what I'm saying. Um, it's just crazy how they bang on said group, said whatever, because they, they they ignore this part of science, ignore this part of history, and they turn around and do the exact same thing. Which is which I mean I'm not I'm not surprised by it, but I mean it's it is what I, it is. I am. <laughs> I am. I mean, I, I mean, I expect it, so I'm not surprised. Like it'll be, it'll be surprising if it was unexpected. But at this point, I expect it. So, I expect it. I expect uh, a a uh, revisionist theories, revisionist uh, hypotheses about history. I expect that at this point. So, all right. So one of the best examples of his uh, his morphological analysis is the the uh, the causative s I guess we call it a suffix. He says that the that the uh, suffix in these body parts is of Negro Egyptian. He compares Zande at at uh, if you look at, uh, as we have already indicated, design names of body parts have a su suffix S-E or E. Um, he compares that with um, Egyptian series one and Hausa. And he includes, again, a Hausa um, word that, that's of Arabic origin. So what the, the problem with this is that the Egyptian and Hausa words are not um, suffixes. They're actually part of the root. So why why is that important? Why is a distinction between part of the root and part of a suffix very important in, in linguistics? It's because you come to conclusions that, the, that what you say is part of the word when, it, when it's really not. So these X, well, excuse me, these S, uh, the S's in these examples are not suffixes. They're actually part of the root. And a suffix right here defined is an, an affix, whether it's beginning, in this case at the end, is attached to the end of a root or stem. So if you're dealing with a root or a stem, these, these words that he uses for Egyptian, for example, are also cognate in Hausa and other ch Chadic languages and they are not suffixes at all. Right. And, and look at this chart to the right in the corner. You can see where these are not suffixes. These are part of the actual root. You look at the Semitic languages and uh, for, for body compared with Egyptian, those are not um, suffixes. You look at the word for bone in Egyptian compared with Berber and Southern Somali uh, dialects. Those are not suffixes. The, the word for side in Egyptian 
compared with Semitic and the word for tongue, which is a, a very prevalent Afro-Asiatic cognate. So again, what we call that is an erroneous morphological analysis. And he does that throughout this book. But this is probably like the best example to exemplify that to the now audience. Is, is this something that could happen if maybe his translations were flawed? Because uh, it seems like if, if it's already a part of the root word, you wouldn't identify it as a suffix if it's part of the root. Like, it's basically trying to separate the word itself. But is it possible that maybe the translations are flawed and maybe because of that, he's mis misinterpreting the root words? No, no, it's, it's a combination of incompetence and not studying or ignoring prior evidence. It's a combination. It could be all three, it could be one of, of, of that, but it's not an excuse. We don't make excuses over here. Like, if you have time to write a 600 page book, you should at least have time to read a 40 page article dealing with <laughs> this particular subject, which there are pl plenty of articles dealing with um, Suffixes, affixes, prefixes. Fixes, yep. Uh, yeah. You learn you learn that in school, to be honest. <laughs> uh, 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 but but if you went to school for electrical engineering instead of historical linguistics, I mean, I don't. I'm not surprised by you not understanding the field as a scholar, which is the the case in point right here. You know what I'm saying? But but not even college. You, you learn. Prefixes, suffixes, and affixes in high school. At least in in America, I would say. I mean, but th again, that, that's 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 the beauty of being a pseudo scholar. You you have no no rules. You can be as rogue as you please, <laughs> regardless of the scientific laws and facts that stand before you. Fuck, I was, excuse me. Get all that. But you know, you know what's funny though, guys. Not to interrupt, is that ahead, in, in, in being rogue, I'm noticing <clears throat> you can't help but to still use the the as a foundation prior research. Oh, but then, man. but then, but then you turn around and ignore it. You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't make, he didn't invent all of this stuff that he's um, going through and comparing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it came from somewhere, but then at some point he decides to ignore and then go a different direction. But you already started by wrestling Basic. with these terms that was already created by other academics. Hey, y'all, that, that, that's Brother Trius. Again, being very brief but profound because that is exactly <laughs> the case right here. Go ahead, man. I know you want to. No, no, I just, I was just laughing because of how true that was. That's that, that's exactly that's exactly the case. Like it's it's crazy how said author said person in this field is just incorrect. But you look in the bibliography, said person in the field is in the bibliography. Like I, that's I don't understand that how. <laughs> Like it, it it's not, that doesn't not make sense. Disagree. It, it's not even because you disagree. It's because you you kind of you extracted something from his book. Like that's crazy to make your argument. That is right, I mean, right. It's not like you came out of nowhere and just started blurting out. Okay, this is this, this, and that, that would make more sense if it was like truly rogue and it didn't have yeah. no no info, yeah. no prior info from other academics, and it was truly rogue, that would make more sense. And you would be like, okay, he's just trying to put it together without talking to anybody else. But he's going and consulting other people and then turning a blind eye and saying, no, nah, it actually go like this. <laughs> man, that's it, boy. You nail on the head right there. That's, that's crazy, man. It is. I, I think people that are too close to this kind of study they be having like a, a bias on it where like somebody like me, I'm a, I'm a layman on it. And so I, I got these different kind of eyes that I'm putting on it, this common sense that I'm putting on it. And it, it just totally blows my mind that, that he thinks this is correct. Um, 
if you if you ready to see something on Facebook like I did, me and Mel and a couple of others, I'm not surprised at all because the way he repeatedly bolsters his views and his uh, premises and downplays his opponents, I'm just not surprised by this. Like this is just a regular day at the office for a pseudo scholar, wherever, whatever field. Wow. I'm, I'm surprised because of how many times this work was recommended. I, I was expecting it to be, you know, a little bit more thorough, but uh, it, it just caught me off guard, to be honest. They have to read it. They, I mean, I'm not surprised by that either. Like, did you read that, that, that other book we did? Like, I mean, did you read that? <laughs> <shit>? <laughs> okay. All right. I mean... All right, so <laughs> moving on. <clears throat> Wolof, the genetic related relatedness of this language has been demonstrated beyond any doubt, any possible doubt, by Professor Sheikh Ante Diop. Again, has been demonstrated beyond any possible doubt. Now, this is this infinite, uh, absolute language that we talk about that scholars typically stay away from. Mm -hmm. Because in science, you have to be, you, you, it has to be falsifiable, at least. We, we have to be able to test it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to be able to test this hypothesis. If you right. say that, demonstrate beyond any possible doubt, um, I hope that you have such surmounting evidence that, okay, you know what? It's, this is a uh, scientific fact right now. Right, like but, were you were you over there speaking to the well off people that maybe had a, a well off speaker verify your fight? Like, do you gotta have like primaries to make that claim? And I think over time that's gonna be challenged. And I think that's where he's making a a, a flaw. I don't think I don't necessarily <laughs> think uh D -op made such a bold claim. No, he didn't. He 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 alluded to some of his claims, but I but I, I what I like about Dio is that you know what I'm saying what we went over, um uh -huh. he said that he wanted the generations to expound upon what he's saying. Correct. Fact check what he's saying. Correct. This is what this is what we said at first, Team Osiris. Yes. You can check it. You can check the timestamps, the date, and all that. We said at first that Dio wanted us, well, wanted the newer generations with more scientific tools and resources to check what he's saying. And I, I respect that about him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But these these new ones, <laughs> oh man, what they're preaching right now is the gospel. And again, in both is of that same cloth of I preach the gospel. I'm absolute. What I say is law, and don't question me. <clears throat> and again, like at it, right? The reader can check that the phonetic matches that emerge from this example are exactly the same, and those that can be drawn from the examples cited, the genetic, genetic relatedness is indisputable. That's crazy. I mean, I think that's crazy because I mean, if you look at it right there, like that's clearly disputable. Clearly. But we're going to move on from that. I'm not even going to touch on Wolof because we spent enough time on Wolof. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this part is the Swadesh list. What is a Swadesh list? A Swadesh list is a, uh, a list developed by more Swadesh comprised of a basic vocabulary that is universal and cultural, cultural uh, free. The Swadesh list helps the comparative linguist answer the most basic of questions when doing the comparative method. Are these languages related or not? Now, <clears throat> it, 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 now it's not the defining uh, indication of genetic rela relationship, but it's one of the diagnostic avenues that you take between two languages. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, these two languages have to have history, some type of history together. You know what I'm saying? And you, what you do is you just 
put this basic list out there. Sometimes it's a hundred. Um, other lists are shorter. Some lists are stronger or, or longer or whatever. But this is the Swadesh list right here. So the, the word meanings come from the Swad the Zande Swadesh list, and you receive from uh, archive.org Rosetta, Rosetta Project. Egyptian word meanings come from uh, Antonio Lipriano, um, Ehrman, and Grupo, and of course uh, Faulkner. Faulkner's list. So. Um. Something I wanted to add about the Swadesh list, just to, to show the importance of it here. Uh, it's, it's used when it comes to assessing the genealogical relatedness of languages, as well as even the dating of their divergence. Uh, so just to kind of show the importance here, it's, it's something that is used uh, quite commonly when it comes to uh, looking at origins of languages. Right. Um, if anybody tells you that this is the end be all of, of uh, um, genetic relate relatedness, that they're lying. We're not saying that. We're just saying that this is part of the whole entire process. Right. So, right here, you got the words for I, you, we, this, that, who, what, not all, many, one, two, big, long, small, woman, man. Um, you can see the first couple of examples. You can probably say, oh, you know, it looks similar, yeah. but the, the further you go along, mm -hmm. person, fish, bird, dog, louse, which is, uh, a, you know, a fly type of uh, insect, um, tree, seed, leaf, root, bark, et cetera, et cetera, nose, body parts, aspects of nature, in uh, any given person's immediate environment. Now, of course, you include you. Hold on, we're, we're, we're going to there. You got claw, foot, hand, again, parts mm -hmm. of the body, heart, liver, drink, eat, everybody eats, everybody sees, hear, no, sleep, die, kill, et cetera, et cetera. And the more you look at this, you looking, you looking like, okay, this is just, Zane in ancient Egyptian does not look like it's cotton. Like at all. Like at I all. haven't I haven't seen one. <laughs> I mean, I, I I would give them the first three pronouns, I, you, and we, but those pronouns are tricky because in Indo-Europeans, yeah. in Indo-European languages, I mean we got me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, uh, chance resemblances and, and pronouns that you just kind of you mostly want to stay away from that. Now, what I could have did, I could have put Semitic, yeah. I could have put Berber, I could have put um, other languages besides ancient Egyptian. But you know, I'm, I'm you know we're gonna say that for later. You know, but. This is for the audience again. Like you can see right here, that none of that looks. I mean, it just doesn't look the same. Like sounds like the same. Again, all right. So, can the origin of African languages um, proposed model be corroborated chronologically with migrations and archaeology? Emphatically, and uh, emphatically claim. <clears throat> because right here, and Boley says, it is hardly necessary to mention that the results obtained are in perfect agreement with the archaeological and cultural facts currently available. After 2010, this is what he's saying. Perfect. <laughs> now, is that not absolute language? Perfect. Like, I mean, like, this is some Mortal Kombat, like, perfect. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Okay, so if you make the claim that what I'm saying is perfect, hey, if I find one little chink in your armor, that means you are incorrect. One, just one little chink. This is why scholars stay away from absolute language. If you say it's impossible, it's, it's indisputable, whatever spectrum, go ahead. 
Uh, I, was, I was just going to say, uh, it, it sounds very much like um, self-gratification and trying to position yourself and couch yourself to be a legend. Like, that that meant more to him than being correct. <laughs> oh, Chris, hey, all right. Look, you, you're giving away the rest of the presentation, bro. <laughs> <laughs> But that's exactly what he was doing. Exactly. Um, and he, and he basically said it. But he are, gave away are. the rest of the presentation. I mean, look at what he's saying right there. <laughs> I mean, it's right there. I mean, you're right. It's right there. Like, per, like, like, you come to the conclusion that your what you're saying are is, is in perfect agreement with the current archaeological and cultural facts. It, it, even take for instance the archaeological and cultural facts as of right now. Most of it, well, not most of it, but some of that stuff is still disputed when you talk about Africa, especially like the central Africa area that's dealing with the forest and, and, and the right. and the um the, the humid part of Africa because of of the rate of decomposition of of artifacts, human remains that archaeologists don't find enough evidence, but we, we still got a clear, pretty good, clear picture of what may have happened in the past, but you see mm -hmm. the verbiage that I'm using, he says it's perfect agreement. All right, so cool. So that means if I find any discrepancy, but, but uh, in contrast to this perfect agreement, that means that he's wrong. Yeah, okay, I see, where, I see what you're saying. Yeah, any, any little thing goes any. in perfect, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> we ain't gonna play semantics with, with perfect now. Perfect means perfect. All right, so you got uh, Hausa smoking in northern Nigeria, southern Niger, mm -hmm. and Chad. What he's, what he's doing here is showing the location of these languages um, that he's using in the book. Sango, Sango. Smoking in the Bogan River Basin in um, Central Africa. Zande also smoking in the same general area as Sango, but including parts of the South Sudan. Uh, and, and you have Somali that's smoking in the Horn of Africa in uh, Somaliland. And of course, you got Middle Egyptian, and which I include Coptic. Which they include as a separate language, which is just asinine. But okay, so since Ebola's model is in perfect agreement with the current archaeological and historical facts, all right. So we, we on the right side, I got this map from my brother, um, my brother Geechee. On the left side, we got Ebola's maps. It shows migration. At the top left corner of Somali, Coptic, Zerma, Wolof, Shango, Nuer, and Lua. And the bottom left is Bambara, Hauja, uh, Zande, Middle Egyptian, Parabantu, Bantu, and other Bantu. So, again, perfect agreement. Before okay. you, yeah, before go you go, I just want to people to look at the map, he's he's saying that you know that they they've all kind of migrated out of that the upper Sudan region. And they came they, from the south, bro. The Afrocentric they came from the south. That that <laughs> south that, that's exactly what he's doing right there on yeah. that left side on both maps. You both maps too, yeah. Exactly. So all right. I can take Somalian ancestry, for example. So scholars have reconstructed proto-Somalian languages that have determined that they're based off their subsistence, in addition to linguistics, that the direct, ancest direct ancestors of Somalians were familiar with camels circa 3000 BCE. However, in Negro Egyptian's model, um, Somali, which is the uh, ancestors of Somali, and there is no mention of camels in in that model which is important because the camels allow the somalians 
or proto Somalians, uh, with, with or proto Sam people that includes Rendile, which is a a lowland Eastern Cushitic language. They allow them to pretend to, to penetrate the desert and inhabit what they call Somali land right now. Also, there's no evidence that Hausa, ancient Egyptians, Sade, Sango people raised or interacted with camels. So, mm -hmm. Negro Egyptian is the proto language, proto ancestor of Somalis. Then that means that somebody in Negro Egyptian should have some familiarity with camels, and that's just not the case. No, nowhere in this book that I, I ain't gonna say nowhere. From what I read in this book, I didn't see anything about camels. And but I only have to read the book to understand about camels because the uh, archaeological record indicates that camels came from somewhere. The 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 tame domesticated camels came from somewhere in between Arabia and the Horn of Africa, somewhere in that region. Somewhere. Not pinpointing. A exact location, but somewhere. So for Somalians to descend from Omotana languages, from lowland Eastern Cushitic languages, um, you can see that the previous branches of Cushitic had no dealings with camels on a domesticated level. But the Proto Sam people, as you can see right here, is Rendile, Boni, and Somali. They had words for camel, which is gall, words for young camel, which is kalim, words for a camel bell, which is core, and other words within proto sam that's dealing with camels. Negro Egyptian, on the other hand, nothing. So on this right side, you see the ancestors to Somalians, which is in Boley's map, which is dealing with proto Somali, you don't. I mean, I don't. I haven't read anything in this book dealing with Somalis, but I mean, excuse me, camels. But if you look at his left side, his map over here, um, this is a map from Christopher Eric, Cushitic prehistory, dealing with proto Sam people and how proto Sam people that deals with Rendai and Boni and Somali languages, they all have or they have similar terms dealing with uh, raising camels and domesticating camels. So if your, if, if in Boley's model is per, in perfect agreement with archeology, span where are the mention of camels? So moving right along, all right, so all right, check this out. So, Emboli is willing to accept Proto Bantu Hausa Fulani, uh, but it's incorrect on a couple of, of bullet points that I made on the left side that the Fulani people are thought to have originated somewhere in the Green Sahara. Uh, in contrast to Negro Egyptians, in, and you see in Sudan or East Africa or Ethiopia, cave art in North Central Sahara reflects modern day Fulani rituals. According to Emboli's very own model, Bantu and Hauser originated in Ethiopia and East Africa. It contradicts the earlier declaration that is hardly necessary, again, that um, arche the archeological and cultural facts available and are in perfect agreement. So, um, Gichi, Brother Geechee, I, I know you're well versed on Fulani history. If you want to go in on that, I don't think he's on here right now. Or uh, I think Brother Ngozi is on here. I don't, I don't. I think he's on here. I don't know. But anyway, um, and Boley says, regardless of the level of rigor that is imposed in this work, it is clear that it has built the theory of proto Bantu Hausa Fulani since it has succeeded in making forecasts which testable uh, have been confirmed by the facts, the Egyptian facts that she was unaware of completely from the beginning to the end of this work. Um, 
yeah, that's just a, another flaw. Like Fulani people have just a totally different ancestry mm -hmm. um, from the other branches of Negro Egyptian. Hey, yo, hold on. I, I got I got to jump off real quick. Hey, go, go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> So here he's saying that the Bangian history, uh, is it from the East or is it from the West? Um, uh, so I believe we, the next slide should show um, where they come from. Let's see. All right, Brother Geetzi, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to speak on as far as the Fulani and their, their origins, as well as whether or not they share any uh, connection uh, to Hausa, Somali, Zande? Well, the Fulani, the, the, the closest language the Fulani would be related to was Siri Siri and, and Wolof. Mm -hmm. For us, language for us linguistically, you know what I'm saying, but genetically they'd be related to the Siri Siri people and also the the Sankai people uh, through their uh, through a lot of uh, maternal maternal lineages. Which is you know what I'm saying, which is got give them their central their central Sudanic uh, their central Sudanic uh, connection. Mm -hmm. With the uh, with 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 the Chadic people, because the Chadic people also have a uh, like a like a Nilo-Saharian substratum within a you know within their people too. Okay. Um. So before Brother Jesse gets back on the next slide, he's gonna show these migrations uh, between uh, the Bantu and the Ubangan. Uh, he's gonna show okay. that. I'll just let you know that you're going to show the influences of those migrations, such as uh, food supply, such as yams, uh, bananas, and you know other yeah. crops and things like that. Yeah, even uh, like uh, a lot of people, a lot of people. Uh, that's another thing. A lot of people always mention the Bantu uh, expansion, but they don't they don't really understand that the Ubangians were traveling too. Yeah, they're going into the interior too. Yeah. Mm. Yo. Hello. Yeah, 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 we here. All right, I, I don't. I had some, well, I don't know what was discussed. Yeah, we, we were talking about the next slide where you, we're talking about that food influences this uh, the Ubangan and Bantu uh, movements. Uh, so he yeah. go to the next uh, section. You see, it will it, show up on the screen here. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the I'm on the call, so I really can't see the slide slides. I, uh, I have some technical difficulties difficulties with the app. I could see the app, but you know, what I'm saying I couldn't hear nothing on there. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely send you the uh, slide so you can have it. Hey, right, brother Josh, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, hey brother. Yeah. Oh, okay. He back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, I was just Go gonna ahead, say, Geechee made me think of something when he was talking about and and the Ubangans. It's like um, if Mboli is to take away Afroasiatic, how does that affect the Nilo-Saharan and the other the other groups, the Chadic and like like in other words, does he account? for the the changes the drastic changes that would be if you were to just remove afro-asiatic because it's not a clean cut that you could just take afro-asiatic to my knowledge you would have I mean, to account, you would have to account for the other changes in the other families the other parts of the he's, family he's not he's not counting them so here's the thing the the whole purpose of negro egyptian remember it's it's ethnic it's ethnically based uh, so if they don't ethnically fit, uh, he's not counting them in. This is why he wants to dispute 
um, the Coptic. He has to separate that from Egyptian. He also doesn't talk about Arabic, and he very minusculely talks about Semitic. So he's isolating them as their own language, not part of a language yeah. group. And that's crazy. Oh my it is. god. It is. He hype he hype he hypo lumping lumping stuff together. Right. Oh, that's oh, crazy. Man. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, y'all ain't seen nothing yet now. But <laughs> but check this out. All right. I, yes, I was, ta I was telling them about the next slide where okay. uh, food was used to show the migration okay. with the Bantu and the Ubangians. Okay. So you go to the next yeah. slide. They yeah, just... yeah, yeah. Check this out. So, okay, so uh, Ubangian history um, from east to west. Now, I'm going to show you why this is a problem. Hold on, let me click on her. All right, so to the right, John Claude and Bowden. The following evidence, the, the following fact. Evidence of banana cultivation was found in southern Cameroon around 1000 BCE. Knowing that banana cultivation was introduced to Africa through the east coast of the continent at some point around 3000 BC. This destroys er instantly every notion of Bantu eastward uh, uh, migration from the Cameroon by the means of agriculture practices. It is the other way around, it needs to be considered. All right, so I ain't even got to like press to the next slide. But bananas for, for everybody listening in antiqu antiquity, they do not show up very well in the in the archaeological record. Say that again. Bananas do not show up very well in the archaeological record. So um and that's part of the reason why it's highly disputed. Now they do find evidence that it maybe was cultivated in East Africa around 3000 BC, but this is the reason why. So right, I, so right I, before Go you ahead. proceed, I disagree with the fact that they were cultivated uh, in East Africa. I think that's an ongoing dispute is that they're trying to differentiate between bananas and plantains. I, I agree more so with plantains, but we all know that bananas didn't necessarily originate uh, yep. in Africa. So yep. I think you, you have to really, uh, I would go more so with the argument of plantains coming from uh, the East more so than bananas. That's just my personal dispute yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, and, and see, that's the problem with the West African date Oh, a thousand BCE in in uh, Cameroon because mm -hmm. they right now it's still a dispute whether or not it's a plantain or a banana right now. Now, I mean, it, it goes back and forth, but I mean, right here, this this destroys instantly every notion. That's an absolute language. Like you have to stay away from it if you're a scholar. So, why do we say that Ubangian history? comes from the east. Okay, so number one bullet point is both the Bantu and Ubangian migrations were contemporary with each other. Um, my source on that is uh is Christopher Air, you'll see later on, but it's not the only one. It's a reason it's a reason why Bantu and Ubangian migrations were contemporary with each other because yams were a major part of or not only Ubangian and Bantu people, but also Niger Congo people. So, if you're dealing with a proto language, or what academia deals with a proto language, and what did a proto people eat? What did they hunt? How did they live? What they call subsistence? How they sustain themselves? Um, they dealt with yams in West Africa. So, where is the center of domestication of the yam? in West Africa, the yam that we know it, is in West Africa. And you'll see the the bullet, or the, excuse me, the source for that. Number four, the introduction of bananas is from Africa, of, in Africa, from Asia, is also included with the taro and the water yam, which is known as, together, the, the banana, the, the taro, and the yam is, is called the Asian trio. Now, you're dealing with Ubangian and Bantu people, it's, it's pretty much uh, 
a known consensus that the taro and the water yam coming from East Asia was introduced to Bantu and Ubangian people. You know what I'm saying? So it's not, if, if they were from the, the East Coast or the Horn of Africa, they would have had those crops and being familiar with it and not being introduced to it later on in history. Number five, other West African Ooh. crops uh, also indicate a Western homeland for Bantu people and the Bargain people, such as the African oil palm and the bush camel. Now, everybody, you can get on your Googles right now, look up the African oil palm, look up the bush camel, and look at the most diverse region of the African oil palm and the, and the bush palm, excuse me, the African oil palm and the bush counter, you find that, that it's in like Nigeria and Cameroon and West Central Africa. Okay. So if you look at the proto languages and what these proto people eat and exploit, they exploited the African oil palm and the bush counter. And if I'm not mistaken, the bush counter is also a deterrent of type 2 diabetes that a lot of West Africans have, well, excuse me, not West Africans, but uh, African Americans have today. It's like when we were separated from that bush candle, all of a sudden, here comes type 2 diabetes. But in West Africa, where they still export the bush candle, um, they don't have a prevalence of type 2 diabetes, with the exception of uh, an American fast food chain, but that's neither here or there, but I'm just saying, <laughs> drawing that connection. Uh -huh. so, so number six, though, now th this is something that I'm probably, sh you know, pretty sure that the conscious community is not aware of. It's the mm -hmm. spread of three distinct strand of what they call a, a helicobacter pylori strand of a virus uh, associated with Bantu migrations. So helicobacter uh, pylori is an intestinal viral infection that's passed on to humans, from human to human. And most people catch it while they're infants, just like chickenpox, so to speak. Yeah. But um, within the virus, uh, it mutates and it, it deals with antibodies and other deterrents and it comes what comes up with a mutation. So, so with uh, the HP Africa one mutation, that's associated with Bantu migrations. Yep, that's a stomach virus too, by the way. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, that's a stomach virus. And again, that that's another <laughs> that's another shot at the whole Bantu coming from the East uh, argument as well. Look it up. Helicobacter pylori. Yeah, it's, right now. HP Africa 1 associated you, with Bantu migrations. It also so, has some microbial causes, too. You can definitely take a look into that. Exactly. I mean, but but on the, con the continent of Africa in particular, they have different strands. Mm -hmm. They have different time depths if we're dealing with how viruses and genes mutate to, to fend off said uh, environmental pressure or what, what have you, that you can see the helicobac uh, helicobacter pylori um, with dealing with the Bantu migrations occurred about 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, right around the time of the Bantu migration. Okay, okay, so the disease is helping the time stamp to show the, the dates of the migrations that is real. That yep. we, we, can, we ain't just pop up in West Africa like a, like a plant growing from the ground and we just showed up in West Africa like, nah, we had migration. Hey, uh, Gitty, you got some noise in the background. Okay. So, so the no, 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 no. basically a, a timestamp showing that these migrations are real that that we'd be talking about, and we didn't just kind of sprout up in West Africa on some like yeah. mythical yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, because because you know, because according to the other side, that 
you can't use genetics for migration patterns and and blah 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 because this and that and third now you gotta take into consideration the context of what we're talking about thousands of years ago we, we we did not have delta we didn't have southwestern airlines we didn't have <laughs> air africa you, we didn't have all that shit like so traveling was not a thing all you know what today i, I feel like going from, from right, right. You know what I'm we saying? Have, like we, we, we have Toyota or Mercedes or none of that. And you no, gotta take I, food. With, you gotta take food with you too. Keep that in mind, especially if you have children and you're moving. It's almost like how our early our early ancient ancestors moved. How they you know would grab you know whatever they needed at the time and then uh, moved along the country. So I think it's crucial. It, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. It, and, and it, it, it points to a West African origin of the Ubangian and the Bantu people. But, you know, the Bantu people, I'm going to just let go right now because we've got some stuff in the chamber when it comes to the Bantu people. But the Ubangian people dealing with what we're talking about right now in the context of John Claude and Boley and his book right now, like that, that East African stuff, as of right now, what they ate. And how they lived, and et cetera, et cetera. It, it points to a West African origin. Now, well, Europeans, this Europeans, that. If you want to look at a European source, um, here we go, right here. Proto Indo European trees. Why is this important? Because Proto Indo Europeans on the, 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 the Pontic, Cat, Capsian, uh, the Caspian steppes of of uh, Eurasia came from a, a particular point, which is pinpointed by a lot of scholars. And what they do is, is, is a synthesis of genetics, archeology span and linguistics to say, okay, they most likely came from this area. What's in this area? What did they eat? What did they exploit? What trees did they see? What type of environment? They saw snow, they saw wolves. They domesticated wolves and and eventually got dogs. Um, they saw wild horses. They developed the way they, they domesticated wild horses into uh, tame or domesticated horses. Um, they developed the wheel, and they seen um, they seen birch birch trees, pine trees, apple trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you have a question about well, how do you determine what a proto people ate, saw, and sustained themselves? Here's a book right here, Proto Indo European uh, Trees by Paul Friedrich. Mm -hmm. And this right here just okay. So throughout the book, he talks about how Semitic and Egyptian only has similarities because. Of prior contact. Oh, Middle Egyptian had contact with Semitic Semites and vice versa. But in his book, he'll say the Semites borrowed everything from Negro Egyptians. But you got right here verified contacts between Arabs and the Zande. The 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 Zande actually spoke and, and written and wrote in, in, in Arabic. This is verified. Like you can look up this source right here. The use of Arabic as a written language in Central Africa. The case of Uele Basin in northern Congo in the late 19th century. They actually wrote and and spoke uh Arabic. They were Muslims. So it's like they were immersed in a Semitic culture. Now, does the author take into account of that? I don't think so. That's just another key point you can, you can uh, consider. If anybody wants to want to interject, why we want to? I, I, I don't. I don't know in Boley's works and stuff like that. But does he show any equivalent um, groups that are writing in this Negro Egyptian to show, like, to to support what he's talking about? Oh no, Egyptian the only ones writing in in, in anything, bro. Oh man. I know. I was I was I was disappointed too after reading six hundred pages 
a straight up BS, but hey, whatever. All right. The concordance between Semitic and the Negro Egyptian languages are more numerous in the field of grammar, but as the case of vocabulary, in no way are they genetic in nature and explained best by borrowing uh, the facts of Negro Egyptian, the fact that total absence of etymology of proto Semitic most friends are concerned. This is in boldly saying that. Yeah, it's similar between Semitic and Egyptian, but it's because they borrowed everything. Everything. Like, I, I mean, this is part of the reason why I didn't put a lot of stuff dealing with Semitic languages in here, because to him, it's just, it's just borrowed. Like, it's, what's the point? But I did put some stuff in there in contrast to Zande and Sango, because these are the, the two odd languages excluded from Afro-Asiatic. So in a way, moving on, moving on, he say, okay, he says, uh, take for example, the case of Somali Dar, house, the building, and Arabic Dar. A comparative Africanist would not he have hesitated only one second to affirm that the word Somali is alone made to Arabic. We would demonstrate that it's pr precisely the opposite. I guess he's saying, that uh, Arabic, the, the the third bullet point, Arabic dar is absolutely isolated in Semitic, and the Arabic dar has no etymology in Semitic, and Arabic dar does not explain the presence of long uh, vowels in Somali. So if you look at the examples to the right, you see that uh, dar, or Arabic, whatever, uh, house does have etymology in Semitic, and it also explains the long vowel in Somali. So those long words like uh, saharak, uh, sincerity, uh, that, that Arabic uh, long vowel um, translates into a Somali long vowel, and et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the other examples, you see what I'm talking about. So. When you say in the third bullet point that is absolutely isolated in Semitic, that's that's clearly not the case. And Arabic Dar does not explain the presence of Somali vowels. That's not the case. Like I mean, I don't know what to say besides warning everybody listening and aspiring scholars: don't use absolute language when you're dealing with scholarship. So that's incorrect. In any yeah, field, yeah, 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 in the field, bro. <laughs> like, like this one right here. Okay, Lashan or the word for tongue. He says it's a Proto Bantu prefix, and of course, he made a reconstruction. See, this is an example of the reconstructions in chapter six and seven and eight that I just did not want to flood you guys with. Okay, so he says, oh, this is a prefix. The, the, the Li prefix is a Bantu, and the S is a suffix, blah, blah, blah. And he says right here, these are the facts. But you're going right here. Uh, I got it uh, right here, Egyptian tongue with various Afro-Asiatic cognates. You got the sources right here. You've got Semitic cognates with Egyptian tongue. And body parts ending with N. Uh, the distribution of tongue in Berber, Chadic, Egyptocops suggests a common origin with Proto Semitic. And it's been postulated since the 1800s. And of course, uh, the saying that, uh, that Li is a, well, Li is a Proto Semitic, well, excuse me, a, a Bantu prefix. Is just is incorrect. I don't know what else to say. Like, I mean, you got the amount of evidence right here to the right, and you have in bonus evidence to the left. But you can see in Semitic languages alone that that's not a prefix. The Lee is not a uh, is not a prefix. You can see this the 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 end is a suffix of many body parts, in contrast to what in bonus says it is. Mm -mm. So, uh, this is, this yeah. ain't looking good. This is not looking good. I don't like this, man. <laughs> it, it, it gets worse, bro. I'm trying to speed up through it. It gets worse. Oh, the the, the Tanu 
or the Tamahu or whatever you want to call them, they are not white. But according to Mbola, they are white. They are proto-Berber, uh, 3,000 years before Jesus Christ or BC. They arrived in Africa, according to him. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, the Amazigh or the Berber people are, are not African. But it, it's crazy ironic that he calls the Berber people not African with not considering that Berber people share a similar ancestry with Egyptians. Very similar. And, and even some sub Saharans. And we got some yeah. of the same paternal markers. Yep. Yep. Th th this has all been proved in 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 Boli's time. Th this is why this is crazy. Yeah. Like like Berbers migrated just like us through inside of Africa. So it's not like they just showed up. Yep. Yep. Uh, he, he calls them the Tehenu and um, yeah, the local population came to add white populations. And that's how you got the, the Tehenu, but just, just overlook that the closest people to the, the transcontinental region of Egypt are Egyptians themselves. Just overlook that fact and just say, all right, those people from the outside skipped over Egyptians just went and intermingled with Berbers, and that's how we got light-skinned Berbers today. But wow. Egyptians are black. Wow. All right, exactly. All right, so moving on. So the, the Negro Egyptian influence proto indo European, page 518, the, to our greatest surprise, it is the reverse, which is the product. The roots of indo European, that it can be considered as borrowed from Negro Egyptian, are much more numerous, and some even belong to the basic vocabulary of Negro Egyptian, page 518. All right, so now this that is, is that is a bold statement. It's a very bold statement, but you know, if you remember, he said this, this is a very modest, very modest uh, 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 undertaking. This is what he said. Anyway, all right, so you see right here, he has different etymologies of Proto Indo European with Negro Egyptian. Uh, he has heart with, uh, I don't know, see, see these reconstructions. I don't know what that is but the word they use for middle egyptian excuse me is a recent innovation come over here to number 40 the word for woman like he equates proto-european -in -proto urine uh woman with a uh, negro egyptian being fat like i mean i don't <laughs> i'm confused by that like <laughs> Like what type of semantic? Like you calling? I, I don't know what I don't know what he's trying to say, but fat and women obviously go together. Hey, I didn't belly write it. Too. Uh, belly uh, too. And, and belly too. And belly like that. I think that's perfect. <laughs> hey, what can I say? I didn't write it. Uh, all right. So in connecting Proto Indo European and, and uh, Egyptian. Look at this. You got wolf, number eight. You got wolf. Uh, this is typical Proto Indo European word, also carries Negro just prefix W. If you want to bring it closer to Negro Egyptian, see, now, now here, here goes this reconstruction with a reconstruction. Whatever you see, uh, ash, 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 you, you this is a reconstruction with a reconstruction. And he, he compares that with a ferocious beast, and he compares elephant. Uh, with the link between wolf and elephant. And this is what I mean by semantically way. Like, don't, just, just don't mind comparing wolf with other four-legged furry animals, just compare it with an uh, elephant. Yeah, and, he, and the key word here is ferocious, not necessarily beast, but ferocious. So when you say ferocious, Elephant doesn't necessarily apply, but no. I mean it's funny. But it's funny. Look, look at this. Like, how do you compare an elephant? The only elephant, elephant you can probably compare is like a mother defending her young, or an elephant, a male elephant in musk. 
that's it. Like, other than that, elephants are relatively docile mm -hmm. creatures. But that's what I'm saying. This 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 uh semantic leeway. All right, so what we got right there, like elephant and the wolf. Maybe this is what Bigger or just saw twenty thousand years ago, fifteen thousand years ago. I don't know. This is probably what they saw right here. I don't know. All right, so to the right, even Martinet uh, even recognizes that uh that this this word for tongue. Is a compound word, but no etymology in Proto Indo European can be established. We must therefore make up this Negro addition word. I would like for anybody in the audience on the panel to just say that word, whatever this is right here in red, right here, with this H I and the K. -W. I can't do it, bro. I can't do it. <laughs> nah, nah, that's not that's not happening tonight. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Anyway, but but he says no etymology can. And, but see, when you use it, when you use this absolute uh, language, that no etymology can be established in Proto-Indo-European, and all I have to do in Proto-Indo-European is show some etymology, and that statement is false. If you look to the left, that's clearly the the case. You can see where it is established. Right there. And those are the sources. If you want to look them up yourself, there they are. And uh, it says, uh, meaning which bar in Semitic is a form of Lisan. So he goes back to the Semitic form, what we just talked about, um, is borrowed. And therefore, everything lights up in the less uh, detail. We consider that the same word is borrowed in proto uh, uh, in the European under this sound I, I don't know what that is i'm sorry like, incorrect man this is this is not good dude it gets worse um oh so i'm pretty sure everybody sees this red highlighted word called the stratic now the stratic i can see why people would push for the stratic the Stratic is a language family, a super language family that combines Afro-Asiatic languages, Indo-European languages, uh, Asian languages, so in some instances, even American Indian languages. And I can see why, but the time depth between when Native Americans uh, descended from, from Eastern Asians in Russia and in the land bridge, like the time difference between that is so far back that it's, it's I wouldn't say impossible, but the, the odds of reconstructing a common language between people in America with people in the, in the Mid East and Europe and Africa at, at the same exact time is just so far fetched. Yeah, no, nah, those people had already split. They was out of here in in the Bering Straits and stuff like that long before all of this stuff we talking about is even happening. Say that one more time, bro, for the people the, in the back. The 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 American Indian, right, the native that came uh -huh. from that that central um Asian steppes that went through Siberia and all that. That happened so long ago, it was before all of this stuff that we talking about right now. So long before. Yeah. So long before. All right. So so now what you see right here on the screen is Emboli's take on the strata. Uh in other words, Afro Asiatic, Nostratic, Proto World are pure assumptions. Pure. Again, that's the absolute word. You know what I'm saying? And will remain very probably never uh why the Indo-European Bantu and Semitic had long been theorists because there is of rules to explain the new facts. The strategy is the uh, is this other myth mythical object built on sole purpose of linking Indo-European with brilliant ancient civilizations, Sumerian, Egyptian, Akkadian, which you all view as black, um, and one and the last paragraph. 
dealing with the Stratic for finally uh, lead to a proto world, a single language that would have been spoken by our ancestors uh, 50,000, 10, or 100,000 years ago. Uh, that is disciples of Greenberg claim, and no, most green, green, most people that follow Greenberg disagree with Greenberg on that. Like, there's no proto world like that's it, it's such a stretch to combine every single human at that time there so long ago. Like they just leave that alone because when you talking about ten thousand, twelve thousand, twenty thousand years ago, it, it's it's a stretch because of yep. the way. <laughs> Their languages evolve, people evolve, contacts, et cetera, et cetera. You got extinct languages, the extinct branches that is largely unaccounted for. Um, you just leave that alone for <laughs> su such time depths as 10, 20,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then okay. also, mm -hmm. also, I remember people as they move around as they adapt or you know evolve or give up you know go older as their you know, the line goes older they forget certain languages too so yeah you no know, because they they may adopt another language they may you know this is where borrowing will come in they may borrow from another language and then they may forget with that word meant in their own language because they borrowed it from another you know Go another culture or another speak another set of speakers. So that's got to right. be acknowledged as well. You just can't assume that and, they. And that, that's they, natural. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. wait. That the, I, we all agree that that what he's saying right here in this book is facts. We all agree, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 I'm talking about no way. In, 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 the, in these examples, from oh, with the uh, credit is BS. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll say, I, I, I'll say, uh, Nostrata would probably be placed in more of a, a Neolithic type of language if it was a language family, mm -hmm. like, like during like uh, during the time of the Neolithic, Neolithic revolution, like me and Ngozi say. It possibly could have been a, a sister, a sister, uh, a sister language family to Afroasiatic, which which, which <laughs> includes like which includes you know European, uh, 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 and different you know different other agricultural languages like like some of the early farmers farmers that went into uh, that went into uh, Europe they could have spoke some type of Nostratic languages like what you got these different Icelanders like Basque and. All these different different uh, other isolates that you know, what I'm saying it can be ascribed for like even like El Elamite and Dravidian. Right, right, right. So look, look, look. I agree with you saying like you, but you, you said possibly, right? Did, did you not say that? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah, right. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I exactly. have no problems yeah. with that, like because I, I, even Greek, even Greek, you said Basque, but a couple other languages have Afroasiatic or uh, an African substrate to them. They can't identify it, but they clearly see that, yeah, these language families or the, these these strands have African substrates to them. But you, you lead up the possibility of it being falsified by saying it's a possibility. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's kind of like how we talk about in genetics with the ghost populations. Like, uh, there's yeah. genetics that we haven't accounted for yet, but we kind of think that they might exist. So it's languages like that too. Like we can't just be arrogant and think that all these languages that we know is the only languages that ever was. Like how Correct. Mel was saying, yeah. Mel was saying people might forget a language over time through borrowing and shit. And so like we, we have languages that we'll never get back that people was using at one time, but we'll just never know. Yeah, some languages, right, some so. languages die out. Some, some, some languages just die out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's facts. So, and and 20,000 so 20, years is, is way more than enough time for that to happen several times over. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you got a Nostratic. So, what is Nostratic? Nostratic is a hypothesis proposed but still controversial, you know what I'm saying, language family of northern Eurasia. The term Nostratic is, was proposed in 1903 by the Danish linguist uh, Holger Peterson 
to encompass inner European, Uralic, uh, Altaic, Afro-Asia, and possibly other language families under one broad and category. Like, See, not, not, not. Like, that, uh, that's the problem. And caucus. And the yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, North yeah. Caucasian. Yeah. See, now that that's the problem because you know if we talk about Afro-Asia added, I'm pretty sure like based off the data, it it originated somewhere in the Horn or the Sahara. Like that that's our consensus right there. But oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, but but largely it is so disputed that academia, for the most part, don't even entertain it. So, and Boley disagrees with Nostratic. He has some very valid points about Nostratic. So, hopefully, his model does not mirror Nostratic. But ah, uh, okay, I see where you're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. All right, like now. Now, look, look, check this out. Now, when I, when I did this research, I was looking <laughs> up, like, every single bullet point that I had on Negro Egyptian, I was looking up the onomatopoeic sounds. I was looking up the inconsistent uh, sound correspondences, the short forms, monosyllabic forms, and the bad semantics, the borrowed words, and the inclusion of super families. I said, you know what? Let me look up. Has this... Is this unprecedented or has this been presented before? You know what I'm saying? And look what I found. Lyle Campbell, historical linguistics. This is supposed to be, according to the experts in the conscious community, this is supposed to be the, the framework, the reference point of how to do historical linguistics. And if we look at the problems with Nostratic, according to Lyle Campbell, who wrote this this book and wrote an article in 1998 about Nostratic. Oh, don't do it! Don't do it! Descriptive forms, onomatopoeia. That's the number one problem. Number one no. problem. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Now check this keep, out. Keep going. Keep going. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to explain onomatopoeia later on, but that's the number one problem. Number two. Sets with only two uh, families represented. Now, nah, that, that was a problem. In, Keep in going. <laughs> but non-conforming side correspondences, non-conforming, inconsistent, short forms, monosyllable oh. words, semantically non-equivalent forms, some cases, some uh, 55 cases, 42% involve uh, comparisons of forms, in different languages that are fairly distant, distinct uh, semantically. I mean, we've seen that too. You know what I'm saying? I ain't have to present 55 cases. I'll show you why I didn't have to present 55 cases. Diffused forms. Given the history of Eurasia with much language contact, it is not surprising at all that most, that some of the forms turn out to be borrowed. And we've seen that too. Man. Molly Hauser. And number seven, it includes Inter-European, Uralic, Altaic, uh, Kirtavillian, Dravidian, and Hamidosemitic, and Sumerian. And on top of that, the strata can be a, a morphing language family. You can add anything you want in there because you have several scholars that still hold on to the strata and say, okay, I'm going to add this in there. So the literature varies, but you have a couple of leading proponents of Nostratic. So once again, in conclusion, according to Lyle Campbell, who is the, who is the, according to the other side, Lyle Campbell is the reference point on how to do the uh, historical and comparative method. Once again, for these reasons, such the <laughs> These are the most historical linguists reject the uh, the Nostratic hypothesis. If you look at side by side, what I just said, that is. I'm looking just, at it, man. Man, it's like you went down to the range. They gave you a fifty cow handgun, and you just went off. <laughs> <laughs> facts, yeah. facts. I mean, there's no get, there's no getting around this. Once you look at it, like the way you have it set up here in the slide. You can't get around that. You have to observe the same rules, otherwise you a hypocrite. 
Oh, did you say hypocrite? Man, the right, the writing is on the wall. I see what you did there. Like I see okay. it. <laughs> you. You say hypocrite. That's interesting that you say hypocrite. All right, right. Look right here. Here's my source. Right. Hey. All right. Yep. Here's both, my other source. Both of them. Both of them. Yep. There hey, we before, go. Right there. Before right. before you go to the next one, go I do want you to explain uh, for the people uh, out of Montepia, because uh, when you say that. <laughs> it is based off of those 10 towns. You want to at least explain what that is. That way they can understand. That, that I, I'm glad you said that, my, my brother from another mother. Um, that will be explained very shortly. The 10 onomatopoeic sounds of Negro Egyptian. And why is this important? If you look at the strata, which in bold it says, oh, it's impossible and it's not true and Blase Blase using yeah. his absolute language, the stratic uses descriptive forms, i.e. onomatopoeia. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but how, but how, but how you gonna use onomatopoeia on a dead language? Oh, but, oh all right. snap. All right, yo, all right. All right, look, look, moving right along, bro. I'm gonna show you why right here. All right, so even the stratic versus Emboli, they use the same, they, they use similar reconstructions. So if you're saying the strategy is BS, then why do you both have reconstructions for heart in very, very similar fashions? You say that the strategy is BS because it, it uses reconstructions for heart in, in, uh, in uh, Afro-Asiatic and in a European, oh, that's BS. But on the left side over here, number six, you see that the Emboli uses the same exact reconstruction for heart. Jesus, we go, man. We, we go <laughs> fun in, in both languages, 10 on the left side, number 76 on, on the right side. We, we got number eight on the left side for wolf and number 18 on the right side for wolf. Now, we know archaeology, like like archaeological wise and culturally culturally wise that that wolves evolved somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere into domesticated dogs. That wasn't that was not an African innovation. It just wasn't what we call African. It just was not. We did receive dogs. Yeah, we got jackals and and, and, and uh, uh, spotted dogs and stuff like that. Uh, ours remain wild, in other words. Ours remain wild. Yeah. In, in no, yeah. Well, somewhat you had you had some you had some domesticated dogs that like they stay that like semi wild where they like just follow, you know, just follow people uh food sense because you yeah. got like little dogs that be like a little. Like, you know what I'm saying? They'd be around like a. Uh, oh, yeah, where they self, site, they self domesticate. The self domesticated yeah, yeah. Of, like cats. Yeah, like yeah. cats. Yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Hold, hold that thought. Both of y'all hold that thought. So, this example right here shows that they use a similar criteria for reconstruction. But if you look back, like, he has a problem with, with, uh, with, with the strategy. But then it turns around and does the same exact thing as Nostradic. Like, I just don't understand it. Like, down to the words. Like, I see what you did there. Down to the exact words. The heart, to the, the wolf, the dog. Like, that's crazy. That's crazy, bro. But that's, that's crazy. Hold on. Like, nah, nah, nah. This is what we're getting at. At the pinnacle of the whole entire presentation. All right. In some cases, uh, and boldly, inadvertently compared some widely accepted Afro-Asiatic colonies between Egyptian, Hausa, Somali, and other branches. Uh, if you look at the word for, for die in Middle Egyptian, you look at Hausa or Chadic, you look at Somali, you look at Semitic and Berber, you see clear continents. Now, in his own book, he didn't have a, a, a clear continent for that. <clears throat> Same thing for tongue, same thing for, for copulate, same thing for uh, to be good. 
because the N is a is a is a prefix. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Same thing for bone. The same thing for village in in Egyptian and Berber. But we're not gonna dwell on that. All right. Oh man, look, look. This is the pinnacle. This is the pinnacle right here. Revisiting the suit Bidi's reliance on uh, the origin of the African languages. I'm trying to figure out what is the importance of the origin of African languages in regards to the suit Bidi, because apparently we didn't go, we didn't do a good enough job by reading the suit Bidi. Oh, because we didn't understand it, we need to go read in Bowie's work. It seems one of the pages. Nobody on Team Osiris knows how to read. Apparently, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, we ain't, we don't do homework. We don't research. Blaje, Blaje. Okay, cool. Here it is, right here. All right. If you, if you, for the for the listening audience, if you are familiar with our older work, citing in Boli, in the Sudbidi. Here we go. <laughs> I'm pretty sure y'all remember that. It keeps going and going Yo. <laughs> and going and going and going and going until we hit the jackpot. Three, okay, boom. Not even considering the times that he could he referenced himself. <laughs> wow. Okay. Hey, so here's what I got to say about this. This Go in, in academia, this is a no no. You don't you do not do that much citations. Off of just one work, if they have Mel, why, why, why? T- t- okay. Tell me why. I, one, it's unnecessary because you could have just wrote a review. Oh, oh. <laughs> ah. Okay. You could you could have wrote okay. a paper. You could have wrote a paper, and it would have been a review of that book, and that would have been enough to say, "Hey, I either support." Or I critique uh, this particular artist's work. You don't necessarily right, need to write check, a... check this out. Wait, well, check this out. I disagree with you right there. Tell me another <laughs> reason why citing one particular source is this problematic. One. Well, well one, I, I, I personally believe just using one source only can show that there's a bit of a, a bias uh, uh-huh. with that particular person. Uh, this is okay. why. This is why in academia we no longer accept uh, what is it? Uh, uh, peer review. Peer review, yes, for yep. the same reason because they they're showing the peer review now. Uh, they're they're detecting biases within it, so they no longer accept it. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Let's move on. All right. Page uh, twenty three. According to M. Bowley, according to the suit beating, M alternates with B. Okay, you know. All right, so right here at the bottom, M. Bowley got uh, in Middle Egyptian and Hauser have respectfully M and Ma prefixes as place names. That is a common Afroasiatic feature. And you can look at it right there, like this source. 2017, as of 2017, you can look at that source right there. But this is neither here nor there because I wanted to expound on that. So, excuse me. He says that it alternates. Middle Egyptian M alternates with B. What is alternation? Alternation is a variation in the form of a single morpheme in different linguistic environments in a single language. In a single language. Single language. Mm-hmm. So M and B in Egyptian, languages. yeah. So M and B in Egyptian is really based on the variation between Shango and Zande. You're right. Because I, I, we, I, we understand, I, we we understand in Egyptian that M and B come from two totally different phonemes. Yeah, we understand that. You can but, even look at that here on the chart. Exactly, but but see again the the labial uh what what the the nasal the, velis, the, vel- yes. the labial velis, yeah the nasal yeah so so he's comparing oh they 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 just lost a consonant and became 
whatever. All right. All right. So look, this is a historical dictionary compared to linguistics. Our trash is basically the same person. Give the similar uh, definitions of what an alternation. Uh-huh. And it's, it's between a, a similar language. Um, moreover, treating either a true alteration or a case of regional variation as a license of interchange, the relevant segments at will in seeking etymologies and cognates, as is sometimes done by linguistic amateurs, is a positive outrage. Linguistic amateurs. So, right here. Hold on, real quick. Oh, yeah, damn. You, yeah, you stop no, sharing your screen. You got to put it right up. Oh, damn. Hold on, I got me. Now, now I'm going from perplexed to offended. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that. All right, check this out. Again, oh, we got. Hold on, you you screen that up. It ain't. Nah. You gotta come back to the uh, program and click share your screen. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, there, yeah, we, there go. we go. All right. Yeah, you right, see boom. it, right? All right. So, again, we got erroneous morphological analysis. The evidence used to prove that M and V alternates within Egyptian is uh, is dubious. The words descend from a distinct root or are highly disputed or inconclusive. So, if you look at what he says to the right versus what I say to the left, versus the prior evidence on the left, you'll see that uh, like M, like for, 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 for place, is cognate within Coptic, cognate within Hausa, um, and it is, it's found throughout all branches of Afro-Asiatic. Now the, the stone thing, uh, that, that, that could, I'm, I, I mean, I'm not excluding that, but that could be cognate. Now, uh, but it's still, he has to, what he should do is show in contrast his rendering versus the competing hypothesis if he was a real scholar. But of course, he didn't do that. So, moreover, treating a true alternation. Or a case of regional variation as a license to interchange the relevant segments will in seeking uh, at will in seeking etymologies and cognates is a, a is sometimes done by linguistic amateurs is a positive outrage. Mm-hmm. All right, so Nasubi, page 28, and Boli set out to correct this shortcoming by not assuming relatedness between the languages tested. And thus, his new uh, Negro Egyptian was built from the ground up, and he was able to make some unique discoveries. And uh, again, they say that Paul Newman agrees with Mboli, but if you read what Mboli, uh, excuse me, uh, if you read what Paul Newman says, that he said previous scholars took the, took the approach that, hey, let's separate every single language on the earth, and let's just compare it here and there. And scholars tried that, and Paul Newman said out of his own works that 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 uh, scientific requirement, that methodology was thought to be prudent, but upon further review, that it was unscientific. Mm-hmm. And and in, in further reading, uh, in Bolin, before submitting this list, uh, it is good to remember so far that the six languages. Of comparison, this is in chapter five, by the way, the crux of, of this whole entire argument that the six languages of comparison are considered to be without genetic linkage between them. That is, explanations and demonstrations that follow must not be explicably or implicably based on evidence of prior kinship. He did that with Coptic and Egyptian. He said, you know what? 
even though cop and Egyptian has have this intertwined relationship, they're separate. Even though Somali has a, a relationship with Proto Sam, Proto Sam has a relationship with Omotana. Omotana has a relationship with uh, uh, Low East, Lowland East and Kashidic. I'm just going to ignore all that. I'm going to ignore it. So this is what this is what he he's come to right here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, revisiting the suit Bitty, they thought that Paul Newman agreed with them, but according to further new, uh, you know, Paul right. Newman disagreed with them. Yeah, we said that. I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this is an old slide, but in bowling, right here, it says, uh, hey, I'm just going to assume that everything is uh, uh, not related, but that's that's erroneous. All right, now I, I've, I've heard I've heard through the grapevine that uh, the author of Nasut Bidi has changed his stance prior to uh, Timo Cyrus's presentations. There is no connection with Ra and Allah. And that uh, uh, Wesley Muhammad is incorrect. But when, when we read in Boley's work that Nusut Bidi is, is, is 100% reliable on as far as references and sources, uh, and Boley says that basically Wesley Muhammad is correct. That Allah and Ra is cognate by borrowing, what have you, but he says it's cognate. But if we look to the left, like um, the suit Beatty says that, oh, uh, this, this reconstruction is very important to us because it goes down to the origin of the god Ra and so forth. And that Allah is not cognate with uh, Ra, but your very source material says that Ra and Allah is cognate. But playing devil, devil's advocate, um, the the evidence that uh, Emboli presents is reconstructions on reconstructions. So mm-hmm. all all of this falls, if you ask me. Like, it's, it's just a, a pointless argument. No one cares. But, hey, I put it in the in the way. I know he changed his stance. He's not going to say I was wrong in the past. He doesn't have to. It's right here. In his book, is in his previous uh, literature. You can look it up yourself. You can see what Emboli says right here on page 522. And uh, Wesley Muhammad, to the right, wrote an entire book on Rise Allah. Meanwhile, Masood Bidi says, oh, Ra is not Allah. So, yeah. anyway. Ra, 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 Ra will be more equivalent to L. The D right. mm-hmm. it, it will be. It, it will be, but but my thing is why I agree with Mboli when Mboli agrees with Western Muhammad. That doesn't make any sense. Did you read right, right, right. Just to, for yeah, the sake yeah. of showing the argument there, not to say that Ra is really a law, but just for the sake of the argument. Yeah, take like, it out, yeah. Like, like, okay, so Mboli came out in 2010. Masood Bidi came out, what, 2015? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm. So you didn't catch that? Mm. So did you read? So did you read the book? You remember how you always talk to people? Did, did you read? Did you read it? Did you read? Did you read the shit? Oh, 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 of course not, bro. Check, check this out. Okay, so uh, all right. Now this is just for the audience looking at home. Uh, correspondence one sixty three with Nail and Lord and blah blah blah. Um, in Zande, it's a different different word for for owner i couldn't find a lot of the, the stuff that they boldly said i couldn't find and not because i didn't try i tried i couldn't find he listed very obscure words but if you look at the the formula that he formulated for the change of 
of F and Egyptian and P and F and Shango and F and P and Zande, that the word for neb doesn't equate. Does it, it just doesn't. Now you can go back and look why I say this. Just look over it. Correspondence 163. For Neb in Egyptian, you got Semitic cognates. You know what I'm saying? You got Inzande. You got MB for master. I couldn't find that word. And I use the same sources that, that Ebola used. Maybe he knows some sources I didn't know. I'm just leaving that open. But I couldn't find it. Moving right along. All right, so right is all right. So Triz, uh, Gula, and Mel, Consul, whoever want to chime in. Nah, nah. Okay, so check this out. The suit beating on twenty nine and page one sixty four says it agrees with the, the onomatopoeia origin of Negro Egyptian. All right, the entire language of Negro Egyptian derived from 10 onomatopoeia words. And in the suit BD right here on uh, this paragraph below, it says that the first lexemes were for the cut of uh, or the sound of dry wood, action of blowing the nose or the mouth, the mouth in the process of chewing, action of smelling, no one's invented by voice, et cetera, et cetera. It can be said, however, that the small human community of tens, of a few tens at, uh, at the most, which had distinguished from its neighbors by increase in its seed for communication. The gestures are not enough anymore. They had to call on voice, just, uh, they had to call on, on, on the use of words. So what this, Left side is saying is that Negro Egyptian speakers only had onomatopoeic words. Why is that important? Look to the right. We go back to Lyle Campbell Historical Linguistics. It talks about onomatopoeia. And it talks about why onomatopoeia is totally out of the equation. We talk about proto languages, proto people, et cetera, et cetera, because onomatopoeia is a very weak and inclusive way of, of tying people together. A, a way to reduce sound minutive factor is to omit the considerations which which it, which uh, words with cross linguistically often imitative in form, and then goes on to the same definitions that Ebola used, like blow, breathe, suck, laugh, cough, sneeze, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And onomatopoeic forms are eliminated from proposals of distant relate, uh, genetic related relationship because their similarity may be explained by a mimicry of sounds in nature rather than inheritance from a common ancestor. Now, what does that mean? Why onomatopoeia is largely unacceptable? You got language A that no, does not know and language B. Language B that doesn't know language A and doesn't know language C. Language C doesn't know the prior to or the next one. Language, you know what I'm saying, et cetera, et cetera. But if you get, you get uh, five people from totally different languages and you give them an onomatopoeic word like who or ha ha, regardless of the phonology or the phonemes in their respective languages, they're going to hear the same exact sound and it's not contingent upon a common ancestor, mm -hmm. which is why onomatopoeia sounds are completely irrelevant when it comes to genetic relationship. So more on the onomatopoeia uh, origin of uh, language theory, like John Jacquois Reso is one of the, the founders of this onomatopoeia law, he says the quantity of rhythm uh, would provide for the sources of combinations, blah, blah, blah. Most of its roots words come in with imitative sounds, either by accents or passions or of uh, uh, perceptible objects. Onomatopoeia would certainly make itself known. 
or makes up felt. But again, like the onomatopoeia or origin of languages is just, it's almost in, it's almost in the same category as human beings came from, came from chimps. People that still say human beings came from chimps are in the same category as, oh, our language came from onomatopoeia. They're in the same category scientifically because that's outdated and no longer tenable at all. So if anybody want to expound on that before I move on. No, I'm not. Go ahead. All right, right cool. Mm -hmm. Anyway, th this is more this is more evidence of in Boley just just not keeping with the scientific practices. And right. To the left in the, in the left hand corner, just parroting what Emboli says, and then we check Emboli's work. Emboli doesn't keep with the scientific practices when it comes to the to, to the comparative method. He uses uh, ball words and, and breast and hausa in the left hand corner of C and Middle Egyptian. You know what I'm saying? He uses uh, he left out a couple of words over here. He uses semantics, so. The, the audience can see this right here. Yeah, and this, this is more yeah. of the same, but I'm glad you, you showed that these are actual citations from Mr. Bibby. Oh, oh, of course. Here goes some more. Watch this, watch this. So that, that, that formula, that the N with the labial sound equals M, that's incorrect. They're right here. Hey, bro, look, look, hold on. I got, I got to pause it real quick. I'll be right back. So, Mel, that it sounds like uh, trying to force something that ain't there with these re with these reconstructions. Right, because he's he's basically trying to make something that doesn't exist. Um, and I think when you do a reconstruction, you got to kind of look at what's already there and build from that rather than to just make up something. And I think that's the whole issue that we have with the book more so is that it's not necessarily grounded in anything that's solidified. Right, right. It, it seems like logic, you know, with, with our time doing studies, we pretty much see in any field, once somebody proposes something like this, you automatically have to say, okay, so where can I look to find Right. this negro egyptian like where where is this negro egyptian being documented and, and what's the time stamp on it so i can then feel comfortable being like okay yeah negro egyptian uh loaned this word over here correct i mean i, I don't necessarily need time stamps but it, it will in, in it will be good it will be yeah. cool <laughs> in academia it's appreciated but right right it will be cool it's neither saying take my word for it right now it's like okay just take my word for it we don't have the full language right now correct. but just take my but just take my word that that's what it is correct but i think just to be safe i think uh both Mboli and Asar stays away from dates uh, i've learned that that's something that they usually do not mention uh, in their works is dating. Um, and that's crucial because if you get the dating wrong, it's, it's a possibility that there's much more that's incorrect. Um, so that's usually the possibility there. Yeah, okay, so they're covering their ass. They correct. Cov they're covering their ass with that. But I, I still don't feel comfortable. How, how can I... I guess give credence to this if I don't have somewhere else where I can look at it. Like like with the Semitic loan words, right? With the Arabic loan words, I can go look at the Arabic and say, Oh, okay, look, here it is. That's a loan word. Or, right, or that's a, right. or that's a that's a prefix or whatever, like with the L I or whatever, you know what I mean? Right. Or at least have an event take place like you know, like a war coming in and you know, the dominant society right, right. uses a that's certain type of language. That would yes. be more sustainable because then you could say, okay, this is direct borrowing. Right. Or a migration event, right, where people come together and, and it, you know, right. uh, in harmony or whatever the case may be and share resources. Then you could be like, okay, yeah. Right. 
Yep. Th- this sounds like a lot of forcing and a lot of like, uh, just take my word for it. Believe me, uh, more to come later, basically. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Our brother Josh, are you back? Yo. <clears throat> okay. You can um you can skip past to slide one oh three, uh, because the next couple of slides are just showing, you know, uh the Sue Biddy again citing uh and Boley. Um and you know, like I said, the people can pause it and, and look at it for themselves. You're not just trying to make it too too long. So, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I got you. Like 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 it's right here. Page one of the four. And Boley with the concern the final consonant in and it, it it equals out to a a, a reduplicated in form in Middle Egyptian, it's caught in with Shango, Zane. Right, but so that's a forth. proto. That's a proto phoneme. Make sure that's <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> so anything contrary to that will kind of, will present a problem with that reconstruction. So yeah. Yeah, I can go back and look up the or the uh, sources for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can do the same thing with this one because this is kind of still explaining. Um, you know, this proto aphrasiatic uh com- comparison to the Negro Egyptian yeah um, of soul or God or something like that. So now 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 I, I want the audience to, to remember when I said that in Boley said stay away from proto reconstructions while constructing. If you see right here on this left side in the, in this box, you see Middle Egyptians uh Zande, how's it it's saying go all you see is and abscesses. When you see abscesses in in linguistics, that is a reconstruction upon a reconstruction, and he's not mm-hmm. really showing you where those reconstructions come from. Okay. So I'm going to show you again what he says that that's that's a methodological flaw in in uh, in the application of the comparative method, but he does it. But anyway, you can see where where Netzer comes from. With these examples to the right, with from the K being palatalized to the, the sound in Egyptian. And here are some more sources for that. Yep, other reconstructions. Mm-hmm. And move on. All right. So, again, if you propose a particular change in one particular language within the reconstruction, you must be able to explain it. If not, you have you you run into the problems, um, and again, this is exactly what he did. Yep. You look at it, um, like like Somali, B well for metal, has a continent in Afro-Asiatic Afro-Asia languages. In that box right there, mm-hmm. but he he lumps it together, which he does with damn near every other reconstruction lumps it together into this one super proto language, whatever you have it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, super language family. Yeah, ne- Negro Egyptian is starting to be more and more in the stratic. <laughs> Start, starting to be, or is already, but <laughs> already. it's already, it's already, man. From what you didn't laid out, it's already no strat. Already. Man. Yeah, correct. Let's go on. Uh, uh, reflections, yep, yep. Yeah, we were talking about uh, the emphatic. Like, again, if you remember earlier, we talked about the features of Nazi Chicago and Afro-Asiatic in contrast to each other. Uh, Afro-Asiatic has emphatics that turn into uh, implosives in Chadic and glutarose and other languages uh, such as Semitic, Berber, and Egyptian. Like, the the k sound, or the, little, the little hill glyph that you that you guys the little meta netter like if you look that up that equates to a, an emphatic sound in the semantic and if you look up to the right to what i got these are reflexes of that emphatic sound uh if you look at the two page 253 it talks about how that sound 
right there, the uh, high is off to intense of storm, strong of light to emphasize, long to be long, rising sounds comes from uh, that emphatic sound. You can see right there where that's just not the case. Anyway, like you, you can look up the sources and where it comes from. Don't take my word for it. And that's incorrect. Um, and then like this right here, like <laughs> a population from India bat migrated and contributed to proto semitic Like that's, can somebody just help me sweet video out? Like, you know, you need some help. Like if you can find evidence of somebody from India coming back and mingling with Negro Egyptians or whoever and coming up with proto semitic if you can find the evidence, Hey, please help them out. What reasoning would they have to travel that far? I, I don't know. You, you got the mountains. You got, <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't know what time depth because you know, remember, they don't mention time. So, right. And it's not there. like there's a lot of food supply along that, that pathway as well. So, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah, they, they took Southwestern Airlines or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, going back to this reduplicated N sound in yep. Egyptian, uh, uh, hold on, bro. We, we're gonna pause there. Hold on, I got it. No, let's go to the next one. Go to the next one. Uh, let's see, one ten. Yeah, go to one ten. Okay, hold on. let me, let me, let me, let me. All right. All right. I mean, like, if you look at this 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 chart right here, you can see where these phonies come from. These words, words that he left out, uh, semantics still being played. Uh, look at the word for phallus in Egyptian, and look at the continent in Somali. He doesn't list. Um. The word for, for joy that has cognizance in Semitic, but in in, in uh Zande has game and Somali shake. I just don't know what it means, but anyway, just just just, just check the uh the sources. All right, so this right here is, is a big one. Uh, we talk about Negro Egyptian dialects. Uh, you know anything about uh reconstructions. Dialects um, comes after um, reconstructions of subfamilies and languages. So, in order to have a dialect, you have to determine what's the language, what language family, what, what subfamily it belongs to, what language family it belongs to, and what uh, I guess uh, overall language family it belongs to. So. The, the the main is the main example he uses right here is the the beery the beer uh branch um that includes Somali is the word for for liver so okay so in Somali the word for liver is beer which he chose as part of his evidence for the dialect of Somali and this part was a branch of Negro Egyptian. If you look at what what beer comes from when it pertains to liver in Somali, it descended from these these uh these words right here that you see in the upper right hand corner that's dealing with uh, other Cushitic languages. And taking a step further, you can see Somali compared with uh, Saho. Afar, uh, Rendal, Bani, and other uh, Cushitic and Lowland East Cushitic languages, you can see that it was an internal innovation that led to that T becoming into a B in Somali. So, considering previous classifications, no, that, that, that's just not true. That Bire and whatever dialect he devised based off the word for liver. Which not even counting in Egyptian, 
you can see that it was just total BS. See it right here. Is that correct? And the suit BD on page 34 and other pages also um, repeats this. All right. Origin of uh, African languages bias and other fallacies. Let's start out. Um, straw man. Straw man is, in short, a misrepresentation, misrepresentation of your opponent's position created by uh, you for this express purpose of being knocked down. Traditionally, the straw man is set, set up as a deliberate overstatement of an opponent's uh, position. All right. So at the top, you have. Um, he said that uh, it, 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 it can thus be seen that they're among the Hermito Semitic's two currents among the African mission there together. The first, the majority, is derived from the school of Greenberg and separates absolutely the facts and language of the ethnic facts, while the second, still influenced by Mr. Cohen. Uh, believes more or less consciously to the existence of a link between ethnic languages, uh, Hermito Semiticist, and the populations he speaks to. Uh, he also says it is the former family Hermito Semitic of European ideologies that Greenberg renames Afro Asian in order to remove any ethnic connotation or racial. Uh, but then he also says on the following page, simply because he, being Greenberg, also believes in the reality of the hand rights unconsciously or not. <laughs> like, like, is there any more evident example of you just being extremely biased and misrepresenting your opponent's theory? If, if, your, if your opponent says, hey, I don't agree with that racist stuff, I denounce that, et cetera, et cetera, you have no choice but the, to accept what he says, unless you, you uncover other evidence that says, oh, you know what? Evidence suggests that you still support it, but there is no, he, he doesn't say this language, these people spoke this language because they had this skin color. He doesn't say that in any of his texts. So for you to write in a book, the same book from the next, from one page to the next page, it says, well, he still believes that in that racist stuff because uh, he just doesn't, know it or not like that's just bias like right. what type of message are you trying to convey to your audience your reading audience but he doesn't have a reading audience because nobody's read it even the people that claim they read it hasn't read it but anyway you <laughs> know all right greenberg is simply done to include in his or her new family, the Hausa and other surrounding languages, purely, here, go, here we go with absolute languages uh, on the basis of topological criteria. But if we look to the right, we got Greenberg, how he uh, classifies Hausa. Hausa by far the most adequately described of the Chad languages, employs the NTN pattern, which is uh, now, dealing with gender and number agreement, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. agreement, you know what I'm saying. Uh, the origin is uh, of its very uses and house forms. A basic demonstrative uh, meaning is evident. The various examples of this pattern are uh, enumerated <coughs> and asserted to be common as parents in the same ultimate source of uh, proto Afro-Asiatic or common Afro-Asiatic. And they are genetically related forms. So to sit there and say that he based Hauser in Afro Asiatic purely off of topological criteria is incorrect. Just because you use the word purely, like the absolute language allows people that critique your work to say, okay, you said purely impossible, these words, if we just find one discrepancy. In contrast to what you're saying, that says you're wrong. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. So he says, uh, Antonio Lipriano, this 
himself not believing in Afro-Asia, uh, Afro-Asian. Okay, cool. Here's Antonio Lefriano, and here's what he says in that same is that book that he cites over here. Uh, he says, in spite of the underlying theory, uh, theoretical problems in Egyptian morphology, is nonetheless conveniently described within the Afroasiatic frame, which is capable of clarifying both the uh, synchronic and uh, structures of the language and the remnants of earlier stages. And also on top of that, he's uh, spoken at Afroasiatic uh, conferences. He's headed the board on Semitic and Egyptian languages, like in various universities. So to sit here and say he does not believe in Afro-Asiatic uh, Afro, uh, is just a uh, misrepresentation of his entire career. Uh, some more fallacies. Uh, what is this? Uh, oh yeah, Miss Homburger. She she used great intuition to say that all Negroes in Africa are based on the same original language. She was great to intuition, but Obinga to the right on page 85, we cannot follow the Professor Obinga when it comes, when he, when he concludes from these elements that all languages from Negro Africa, Cushitic, Nigerian, and other houses are genetically related. Like he takes precaution with what Obinga says, but Homburger, has great intuition for saying the same exact thing. Like this is straight up bias. <laughs> this is crazy. All right, here we go. Uh, to be most rigorous as possible, it must absolutely avoid the use of proto languages in terms of comparison. And that is exactly what he did in chapters six, seven, and eight, and mm -hmm. even in uh, chapters nine, like. Example of the the uh, ethiosemitic word nagash that we like to use for for king. Uh, you see that example at the bottom right there on the bottom right hand corner. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it says, but eventually it leads up to nagash. According to him, I'm not trying to figure out what it says because it's he doesn't. <laughs> But hey, he used proto language. Whenever you see the emphasis besides those words, those are proto languages or proto words. So, it was right going on. from a proto word to a proto word. It doesn't make sense. A proto word to a proto <laughs> word to a proto <laughs> word to a word. Like you making up stuff. Saying. That that you making up stuff. Then that that's what that is. You making up exactly. stuff. Exactly. I mean, Freestyle Friday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so comparing these three languages, grammar level, regardless, look, look, regardless of the level of rigor that is imposed or applied in this work, it is clear that it has built a theory of proto-bantu hausu fulani since it has succeeded in making forecasts which, which testable have confirmed by the the Egyptian facts that she was unaware of completely from the beginning and the end of his works. So, uh, this work that I, I think he's talking about Homburg right here. Yeah, he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, he's talking about Homburg. So, Bansu Hauser Fulani is, uh, is based on great intuition, grammar level. Regardless of the, the level of rigor that was applied to it, hey, did a good job. But to the right, the concordances between Semitic and Negro Egyptian are more numerous in the field of grammar. But as in the case of vocabulary, in no way are they genetic in nature and explained best by borrowing. Like, I, I just don't understand how how the uh, Semitic and Negro Egyptian grammatical correspondences are due to borrowing while Homburgers, Fulani Bantu, Hausa, Grammatical correspondences are proof of genetic kinship. And, and by the way, uh, Hamburger's uh, work is largely dated by most uh, scholars. In yeah, the field. yeah. I mean, like, I mean, she what? 
wrote that in what, like 1930, 20, 1930, something like that. Like it's, it's largely outdated. Cause I mean, it's been clear that Bantu, Hausa and Falani have different origins. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, Mm-hmm. Some of the next slides we kind of did discuss earlier. Um, so some of his bias. Check this out. The Africanization of Semitic is a serious method, methodological error that removes any credit to the whole entire work of Christopher Eric in Boley, page 61. To the right, in Boley, pages 530, 531, he says the analysis of proto Semitic vocabulary borrowed from the Negro Egyptian shows that it was Negro Egyptian speakers who went to meet proto, pre proto Semitic populations uh, within them. And it is the basis of this whole entire premise that proto Semitic vocabulary are of Negro Egyptian origin. origin. So he basically does the same thing that Christopher Eric, Eric does. He Africanizes pre-proto-Semitic. When Eric does it, it's a huge or serious methodological error. When he does it, it's perfectly fine. All right, so here we go. More absolute languages. Um, the uh, morphological, lexical, ecological, syntactic, syntactic um, is impossible to establish between Egyptian and Semitic and Berber. Impossible. He uses a uh, other absolute languages look to the right you can look at the source as of 2018 that uh what he's saying is the total opposite hold on real quick all right oh okay, okay. so the choice of sango and zande is because uh zande and sango is spoken by the author. If that's not bias, and you got the, the articles right here that's showing bias in in the scholarship and why it's wrong. Moving right mm-hmm. along. Like, I mean, I can see if he chose these languages because they might be closely related. No, he chose them because right. he speaks right. them. Like, that's crazy. Like that and he's using the ethnic background too, so get that in mind. Right. Uh, right here, crazy. right here. Ultimate proof of genetic related relatedness is semantics, in uh, in contrast to phonetics, grammar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So semantics is something new that really nobody really is aware of, and semantics is basically uh, the origin of it is by a French speaking African, and he's dealing with contact languages, basically. Uh, one, one group of speakers interacting with a group of speakers that don't speak the same language and their semantics or how they understand each other is the basis of this theory. has nothing to do with genetic proof, but this is what Emboli uses. All right. Proto-European and uh, Proto-Semitic themselves should be considered Creoles of Negro Egyptian. John Claude and Bowley, page 612. On the right side, Sango that has a very uh, somewhat uh, detailed history and compared to proto Indo European, well, well, proto Negro Egyptian. Um, Sango is not a Creole, according to Mboli, because it's a risky hypothesis. But Indo European and proto Semitic being a Creole because of Negro Egyptians is, is, uh, <clears throat> is, is, is highly possible. Like, I mean, I just don't understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is yeah. out. Page 621, Negro Egyptian speakers were unable to borrow their words from other languages. Like, the, I, I just think that's crazy also. But Semitic, Berbers, and Europeans all borrowed their language from Negro Egyptians, according to Mboli. Like, so, so Negro Egyptians couldn't borrow anything from these three language families, but the opposite is totally true. Like, 
if you want to believe that, go ahead. I just can't stop you from believing that. All right. Now, th this is this is interesting. The rigorous applications of these principles have has allowed us not only to prove the kinship totally beyond all doubt in genetics of the compared languages, thus reconstructed pre dialectical ancestors, um, but also go back to the ultimate origin of it, a language made only of a handful of onomatopoeias. I'm going to say that one more time. A language made of only a handful of onomatopoeia. Uh, this, uh, it has revealed to us a language invented from scratch in a community of hunter-gatherers previously communicated with only gestures and a few cries. He is talking about Negro Egyptian speakers. All they had was onomatopoeia and grunts and a few cries. <laughs> they was walking around saying <clears throat> they had no language whatsoever. According to what he wrote right here on page 603. And 603. Wow. So they went from <clears throat> to uh Hey y'all, let's build some pyramids. Like I, I hotel. <laughs> Why is he selling? He's selling himself short by by doing that, man. That's crazy. Hey, hey, hold on. If he can do this, he needs to go ahead and, and you know, explain this Khoisan click language. I think he can do it. <laughs> of course. Of course. Everything he touched, bro, turned into gold. According That's to him. That's crazy. It's so what? so rather than say I don't know. He rather say, "Well, here's what it is: these these few loan words that came from Negro Egyptian. But other than that, all the shit that I don't know, we just gonna say it was it was grunts and some fucking low lowbrow shit." Yeah, I mean, exactly, bro. Man, get look, the look. fuck out of here! What? <laughs> what? Think about how ridiculous that sounds. Now, now, if you, if you go back, let me see what what, what slides. <laughs> Let's check this out. Now, Negro Egyptian speakers who at first were unable to borrow words from other languages. What other languages beside Negro Egyptian? Now, he's Egyptian. I just want, I just want a time period. Just a little, are you yeah, telling I mean, me that's the first language? All right, <laughs> so, 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 okay, so check it out. So only the only other language he's really used on in this book is Corsan, uh, Semitic, and Proto-Indo-European. So so while Proto-Indo-European was developing in like 5,000 BCE, 4,000 BCE, Negro just walking around going <clears throat> like, like, hey man, like that's crazy to me. And they went from being Kate, like saying <clears throat> to, hey y'all, hotel, let's build a pyramid. Like that's that's crazy, bro. Like I, I just, this is what he says. This is what the they were from that to loaning words to these other people too. It, it, the, <laughs> Bro, what? <laughs> what? It's crazy. Like, all right, so boom, they were from from grunting like came in to like 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 the Gakko came in to build the pyramids. Okay, I mean, hey, Gakko came Like, I'm just saying. Like, here we go. All right, so Negro Egyptian equals the Hamatic theory in reverse? Question mark. This is this is what I'm saying. Let's just read it. The hematic theory, this, this is regarding the hematic theory. The hematic hypothesis uh, is well known students of Africa. It states that everything of value ever found in Africa was bought here or bought there by the Hamites, allegedly a branch of the Caucasian race. Now, we know as of 2020, that is hardwash. It's been hardwash ever since Greenberg denounced that in equation with language and people speaking, blah blah blah. Right. Ever since right. he's done that, it's been null and void. Okay, you know that that that's that's a hermetic uh, hermetic uh, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But if you look over here to the right, the uh, in Bowley, page five seventeen to five eighteen, uh, the proof of genetic kinship of Negro Egyptian languages. Uh, it shows that one could consider the Proto-Indo-European as a Negro-Egyptian language. Mm. He says also that 
we attract, however, the reason attention to highly speculative nature of assumptions that will be made in the last chapter to comparison that has uh, been achieved so far. But he goes on to say the origin of Semitic and Indo-European, to our great surprise, it is the reverse, the product of the roots of Indo-European that can be, uh, be, be considered as borrowed from, from Negro Egyptians, much more numerous, even belong to the basic vocabulary. So he, okay, so let's just move on. From all the above analysis, Negro Egyptian dialects impose on a whole population of other origin for a relatively long period. Uh, these last populations were, were last populations talking about Indo-European. Indo-European, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. less advanced than Negro Egyptian speakers since most of the technical and social uh, innovations are almost, without exception, of Negro or Egyptian origin. Wow! So he really, he really like crapping on Indo-European speakers. Yeah, um, saying without Negro or Egyptian, they could not uh, speak advanced. And what is that? That is the reverse of the Hermetic theory. That is the, that, right. That this is this is that biblical theory. Like they're wrestling with that. They're like overcorrecting. The they're they're overcorrecting for that. <laughs> it, it's it's a matter of theory with black face, bro. That's all it is. <laughs> right, right, right. They they took hey, that. It. Oh man. All proto indo European terms related to agriculture and livestock are of Negro Egyptian or, origin and is in Negro Egyptian that they have their etymology. Page six oh one. How if they had livestock at different times in 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 uh, time? Well, hey, bro, he don't hey. miss the time. He hey, don't miss what, what livestock did the Negro Egyptian have? Right, right. That's what I'm saying. Like they they didn't even have uh, the same timeline for farming and agriculture. Like, what about the pastoralist? He told he shitting on pastoralists by saying this stuff. Right. Yeah. Check, check it out. The oldest, like the 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 the, the ancestor to the, the domesticated goat is a wild goat. It's still found in somewhere in Central Eurasia right now. Mm -hmm. Central, you know what I'm saying? Like sheep, rams, uh, goats. I can go on and on. Like wolves that came, you know, that, that developed to domesticated dogs. Uh, all that. Came from somewhere in Central Eurasia. It's nothing wrong with Horse, it. horses that horses. were not in Africa. That were not in Africa. Horses, right? Bro, what what about the 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 probably one of the most defining features of Indo-European was the invention of the wheel, like like the the wheel and the horse allowed them to travel further distances and conquer more people. It, that, that's just facts. And that happened right. around like- Eurasia, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how they travel so far. You know what I'm saying? But you telling me that that they, they got were, the word for those from us though? They got the word for that from us? <laughs> yeah, and, and they were less advanced. <laughs> I, I just don't get it. Like two, two totally different, I'm not trying to compare the two, but he, this is what he tried to do in his book, but they were just different people. Like, now I'm, I'm not excluding trade and stuff like that, but I mean, come on, man. Like, these are some outlandish. This, this reeks of insecurity, man. This reeks of insecurity and they bias and overcorrection, right? Because, you know, we, we was being shitted on with the Hamedic uh, biblical type of theory. So, we, so he said, let's go ahead and just reverse that on them. And he said the word reverse in his spiel. <laughs> yep. All right. So, all right. So now the rest of it is just charts. Yeah. You got you, you got the you got the the legend right there. You, you just go through it yourself in mm -hmm. your free time. Like you're gonna go back. Some of the same. Words. Some of the same stuff from earlier, but it's good to have it so you can actually see. This is not just on one occurrence. It's on several. Right. Occurrences. All right, just going through it. Some of that stuff looks similar, but you you consider monosyllabic roots, bar words, semantics, 
uh, leaving out other words. He's like, I, I don't know, like do what? So what does the do what have to do with, with a hole or digging? Like it has nothing to do with that. The original meaning of do what, like the, the, the middle edition word for C, that's clearly Semitic. Here's my source right there. You can look at that. That's clearly Semitic. Clearly. You go on and on. Like you got different word, uh, roots for words like fire, uh, in Egyptian, and some uh, chadic or, or, or hausa. You got a word for nose. I can keep going on and on. Here's my sources. You got the word for cook that comes from, from Berber languages that you saw earlier. Um, like, like leg and wobbly. What does leg and wobbly got to do with? Like, that has nothing to do with it. I don't know. If you want to make a connection, go ahead. But, but we're just going through them because it's pretty much self-explanatory at this point. Like, we, we made our point. Yeah, yeah. We you know what this point. reminds me of, too? It makes me think of, uh, like, in our current modern time in America, us African Americans, how we have our little um, social groups, like for instance, you know, um, uh, Nation of Gods and Nerves, for example, Five Percenters, or um, like the the Nuwapians or the Yorkites and and the various other groups that try to come up with um, reasoning for English language. Like they'll say, you know, Father, and this is all respect due, right? They'll say something like Father, and they'll be like, Yeah, so that means to fat her, like the father gets the lady <laughs> pregnant and, it, and then so it's fat and then her and it's like there's really no cognate there but we just tried to make something there you know and there and there's no follow-up language that you can reference it to you know what i'm saying or like numerology or you might be like uh you know this number means that or whatever but it, it's kind of arbitrary and it's kind of made up you know what i'm saying Fair, bro. it's like the same it's like the same thing it's called folk etymology, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, you making up an etymology that's not there. Yep, it's based on your your folk folklore and your ethnic biases. You know. What right, I'm right, 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 right. So, all right. So, all right. Now we 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 mentioned the two previous um, reconstructions for Afro-Asiatic prior to Ebola's work. All right. So, yeah, so just look at the numbers of the amount of reconstruction entries here that compare. You know, Mboli only has 234, uh, but, uh, you know, Eret has uh, 1,024, and uh, Oro, uh, he, him and uh, I forgot the other guy's name. Uh, Stobova, Stobova, and or yeah. and Oro, they have yeah. 2,672. You got Eric has 1,000. So, so if, if in Bolin's premise is I want to debunk Afro Israel and classify their uh, classification, he should at least equal equal to or greater than reconstructions of the competing two hypotheses or reconstructions. Uh -huh. He only had a fraction. He only had a fraction of that. A fraction, like we doing simple math. Like he, like 234 compared to almost 4,000, 4,000 words. Like no, bro. Like, and then your era of, your, your margin of error is great, is, is much smaller than the other two. Like, especially uh, uh, Aura and Stobova. They have a margin error where they can make a couple of semantic equations and 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 uh, have errors here and there. It's all right. We got we got almost three thousand words. You got two hundred thirty four. And, and 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 on top of that, let me tell you some criticisms of Aura Estabova and Chris Ferry. Not even talking about them bowling. We can just talk about them them two on the left. They they use semantic range in some of their reconstructions, like the probably the most infamous one in Aura and Stavola is the various sets, uh, cognate sets used for for birds like eagle, stork, vulture, ostrich, 
should not be kind of. I'm, I'm just sorry, like, unless you have a super generic term for, for bird that, that permeates all humans. And the point of doing the comparative work is to eliminate universal uh, universal aspects of language that that uh, is related to all human beings. Your point, you, the point of you doing this is eliminate that and say, okay, what what do these languages right here inherit? So, if the word for birds just has that much semantic leeway to deal with ducks, uh, ostriches, um, eagles, storks, et cetera, et cetera, like you just can't you can't uh, accept that and. Aura and Stobova and Christopher Eric make that mistake in some of the examples. But I mean, we've seen Emboli made a lot of those mistakes. Mm -hmm. A lot. And he only has 234 entries. You know what I'm saying? Only comparing one consonant in a word instead of two or more. Now, you, you if you remember, Emboli agreed that. Uh, uh, Proto Bantu and Ithic language uh, in Nigeria uh, that was uh, reconstructed by uh, uh, reconstructed by Greenberg was okay because it used two or more consonants. But if you go back through this this uh, presentation, you can see where Mboli himself used a lot of monosyllabic or one consonant words. That just eliminates. Uh, that eliminates the probability of it being genetic relating this because the high probability of it being chance. And then on top of that, the comparisons between only two languages, that's also a criticism between Ari and Stobova. So if we were to apply that criticism to Emboli, that decreases the number of entries in Emboli's work. So we decrease the number of entries based on semantic range, comparing only monosyllabic terms and comparisons between only two languages in all three of the works. Who you think would stand the, the, the best chance of having the most proven cognates based on sample size? And sample size in science means everything. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? So 234 <laughs> reconstructions versus 4,000 and then considering all the other uh, mitigating factors, you would say that uh, Emboli's work suffers from sample size and methodology. So that's my piece on that. Yep. All right, so Negro Egyptian, based yep. off of 10 onomatopoeic sounds, I, I, I I, I I just want the, the listeners to go and look up onomatopoeia and why that is just not based on the formation of a language family. It helps with the development of an infant developing language, but the infant has a parent, a mom and a dad that already has a language. But when you talk about a whole entire family walking around with and sounds and can't even talk and making grunt noises. That's just crazy to me. And Negro Egyptian, according to Mboli, were only making, they were only making grunting sounds and onomatopoeia sounds. Inconsistent soccer correspondence, short forms or monosyllabic uh, forms, uh, bad semantics, barred words, ignoring prior evidence, nostratic parallels, and extreme bias, it, it, even the hematic theory of parallels. So, look at this. Uh, he started with a conclusion, and his conclusion was that the black Africans uh, all spoke a common language. Um, criticism, I don't know if he's ever received criticism, but this is, uh, this is, to my knowledge, probably the first or maybe second, I don't know. Um, grandiose claims, cherry picks, flawed methods, unrepeatable results, uh, like using semantics, like you just totally disregard 
uh, morphology and sound correspondences and just focus on semantics as as the, the, the greater evidence of genetic classification. You know what I'm saying? Uh, lone merits working in isolation, inconsistent logic and invalid logic. We've seen that in dogmatic and unyielding. So let me see what else, what else I got in here. All right, so how does this, uh, th these screenshots, how, how do they stack up now? Like after seeing all this, starting like this book doesn't exist, who dares challenge the Amara squad and don't be stuck on stupid and John Clark and Boley reclassify all the African languages. Uh, he's the force and foremost uh, epitome of comparative uh, linguistics. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, and this book to the left is based off this book to the right. I'm just, if you, if you come away with, if you walked away with anything, can you walk away and say, well, I still believe the book on the left. After seeing all this, hey, I can't talk to you. You have the trust to believe what you want to believe. But hey, we moving around along. All right, look, look, <laughs> let's just see. <laughs> What was behind all this foolery to the left? Like, and it's clear that was behind all that foolery. Like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it took the Black Flag movement to uncover all this. You know what I'm saying? Timo Cyrus to uncover this, 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 this logical fallacies, strong man arguments, inconsistent logic. Et cetera, et cetera. So that that's my basic that, that's my conclusion with all this work. Um mm -hmm. later on we got we got Black Sumer, Fact of Fishing coming up. We got yep. we got uh the relevancy uh from Babylon to Timber Two and we got some other surprises coming up. So that's me and I, I conclude that presentation. You know what I'm saying? Masterful, masterful yes, brother sir. Joshua. Yes, sir. Uh, I do want to say, um, as far as the book, The Origin of African Languages, uh, it is still currently being translated. Uh, it's been translated by a, a French speaker, so just give me some time on that. Uh, if you do want to have a copy of the book, definitely let us know in the comments. And once the book is finished translated, we'll definitely uh, reach out to you. Yes, man. Peace, power, and love. It was really uh, in-depth um, observation of uh, the work of Jean-Claude and Boley. Um, really not too much to reiterate or say after the fact. Um, this has been a very long and extensive uh, conversation involving um, a subject matter that uh, truthfully gets uh, blown out of proportion because uh, of the fundamental um, usurpation of training. Um, Jean-Claude Mboli, with all due respects to him, those of his like have, uh, are not classical linguistic, linguists. They haven't this was a part-time thing for Mboli if we study his background. And it blossomed and he's a brilliant, intelligent brother. But however, um, we're not above uh, criticism and reproach and uh, critical analysis when uh, using intelligence. And far too many times we circumvent intelligence for um, emotional pride chip. And a lot of it is found in the uh, overcritical uh, use of Afrocentrism and the, and the um, manipulation of black pride. Because if we carry black pride, sometimes it's used against us to manipulate us in, in all facets, even education. So 
this was good to hear. Uh, this was a rebuttal to um, initial claims. And uh, it was a means of giving an opportunity for those who are true scholars to rebut. I find it very unlikely that this will happen. And so if those of you who watch this video, take the time, you know, to watch it. If you have to bit by bit and gain your conclusions. So it was really a powerful uh, presentation, real powerful, real concise. Uh, and I really want to thank everyone for partaking and thank everyone for listening and uh, be on the lookout for other work from Team Osiris, the Black Flag movement. Team Osiris is on the horizon. This is your brother, Kansu Sheshmo Amun, on behalf of Brother Joshua Kane, who did a masterful job, Brother Melvin, Brother Triz, and the rest of Team Osiris. Much honor and respect, and we'll see you next time.